Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. Hi, everyone. Today we are going to bring you the dissenting opinion in Beaver and the Queen, being read by Ariel Weiss. If you would like to hear the majority decision, please go back to the previous episode. I hope you enjoy. The dissenting judgment of Justices Fauteu and Abbott was delivered by Justice Fauteu. The appellant, Lewis Beaver, appeals with leave of this court from unanimous judgment of the Court of Appeal for Ontario, affirming his conviction by a jury on an indictment charging him jointly with his brother, Max Beaver, on two counts. One, possession, and two, sale. On March 12, 1954, of a drug, to wit, diacetylmorphine, contrary to Section 41D and Section 41F, respectively, of the Opium and Narcotic Drug Act. Subsequent to this conviction, the appellant was found to be an habitual criminal, and this conviction, being appealed, was also unanimously confirmed by the Court of Appeal. Leave to appeal as to this conviction has been granted, conditionally, upon the appeal against the conviction on the primary charge being successful. To appreciate and determine the points of law raised on behalf of the appellant on the appeal related to the primary charge, it is expedient but sufficient to relate the following facts. The evidence for the prosecution shows that in the forenoon of March 12, 1954, Constable Tassie of the RCMP, known and operating under the name Al Demeter, was introduced to the appellant by one Montroy, a drug addict, as one who was interested to obtain jointly with him one ounce of heroin. The price asked by the appellant for such a quantity being $800. It was agreed that only half an ounce would be brought and further that delivery and payment would be made at four o'clock in the afternoon at the same place. The appellant insisting, however, that only one of either Tassie or Montroy was then to appear. At the appointed time and place, Tassie arrived and boarded the car driven by the appellant, then in company of his brother, Max Beaver. Having traveled a certain distance, the car stopped. Max Beaver walked out towards a lamp post, picked up a parcel, came back, and boarded the car, and while proceeding to another destination, gave the parcel to Tassie, who paid him the agreed price. Admittedly, this package contained half an ounce of diacetylmorphine. The appellant did not challenge these incriminating facts, but, testifying in his own defense, gave the following evidence. The day before the above-related occurrences, Appellant and Montroy met together. The latter explained to the former that one Aldemeter had double-crossed him, that he wanted to get even with him, and to achieve this purpose made the following proposal, to which Appellant acceded. It was agreed that Montroy would introduce Demeter, who wanted to have drugs, to Appellant as one from whom they could be obtained. A sale will be made, but sugar of milk instead of drugs would be delivered, and the price received by the appellant would be remitted to Montroy. Feeling indebted to Montroy, from whom he and his brother Max Beaver had received certain favors while in a penitentiary, appellant executed this fraudulent plan. Hence, on his story, appellant's defense was that he never intended to deal in drugs and never knew that the parcel delivered contained any. This was not accepted by the trial judge or by the Court of Appeal as being a valid defense in law under the Opium and Narcotic Drug Act. The jury therefore did not consider that defense which was withdrawn from them. The grounds of law upon which leave to appeal was granted are the following. 1. The learned trial judge erred in failing to instruct the jury that if they accepted the evidence of Lewis Beaver or were in doubt as a result of it, he was not guilty of the offense. 
Two, the learned trial judge erred in holding that the accused Lewis Beaver was guilty of the offense charged whether he knew the package handed by the accused Max Beaver to the police were drugs or not. Three, the learned trial judge erred in instructing the jury that the only point they had to decide was whether in fact the package handed the police by the accused Max Beaver was diacetyl morphine. Four, the charge to the jury by the learned trial judge and the court of appeal is an error in holding that the accused Lewis Beaver could be convicted of the offense charged in the absence of knowledge on his part that the substance in question was a drug. The first proposition of law submitted by counsel for the appellant is that want of knowledge as to the nature of a substance in the possession of an accused is a good defense to a charge that he had in his possession a drug, contrary to Section 41D of the Opium and Narcotic Drug Act. This submission rests on the presumption that mens rea is a necessary ingredient in every offense. But, as stated by Justice Wright in Charas v. Rutzen, this presumption is liable to be displaced, and this may be done either by the words of the statute creating the offense or by the subject matter with which it deals, both of which must be considered. This view of the law and of the method of interpreting a statute when the question arises is expressed in many other cases, such as Hobbs v. Winchester Corporation and Reynolds v. G. H. Austin and Sons Limited. It appears convenient to deal first with the subject matter of the act and consider afterwards the provisions directly relevant to the offense of possession. The plain and apparent object of the act is to prevent by a rigid control of the possession of drugs the danger to public health and to guard society against the social evils which an uncontrolled traffic in drugs is bound to generate. The scheme of the act is this. The importation, exportation, sale, manufacture, production, and distribution of drugs are subject to the obtention of a license which the Minister of National Health and Welfare may issue with the approval of the Governor General in Council, and in which the place where such operations may be carried on is stated. Under the same authority are indicated ports and places in Canada where drugs may be exported or imported. The manner in which they are to be packed and marked for export, the records to be kept for such export, import, receipt, sale, disposal, and distribution. The Act also provides for the establishment of all other convenient and necessary regulations with respect to duration, terms and forms of the several licenses therein provided. Without a license, it is an offense to import or export from Canada and an offense for anyone who, not being a common carrier, takes or carries or causes to be taken or carried from any place in Canada or any other place in Canada, any drug. Druggists, physicians, dentists, and veterinary surgeons stand, of course, in a privileged class. But even their dealings in drugs for medicinal purposes are the object of a particular control. Under penalties of the law, some of them have to keep records of their operations, while others have the obligation to answer inquiries and in respect thereto. Having in one's possession drugs without a license or other lawful authority is an offense. In brief, the principle underlying the act is that possession of drugs covered by it is unlawful, and where any exception is made to the principle, the exceptions themselves are attended with particular controlling provisions and conditions. The enforcement sections of the act manifest exceptional vigilance and firmness, which Parliament thought of the essence to forestall the unlawful traffic in narcotic drugs and cope effectively with the unusual difficulties standing in the way of the realization of the object of the statute. 
substantive and procedural principles generally prevailing under the criminal code in favor of the subject are being restricted or accepted. The power to search by day or by night either premises or the person is largely extended under Section 19. Special writs of assistance are provided for under Section 22. The consideration of the provisions of Sections 4 and 17 being deferred for the moment, the burden of proof is either alleviated or shifted to persons charged with violations under Sections 6, 11, 13, 16, and 18. Minimum sentences are provided or are made mandatory under Sections 4 and 6. Deportation of aliens found guilty is also mandatory, and this notwithstanding the provisions of the Immigration Act or any other act under Section 26. And the application of the Identification of Criminals Act, ordinarily limited to the case of indictable offenses, is by Section 27 extended to any offense under the Act. All of these provisions are indicative of the will of Parliament to give the most efficient protection to public health against the danger attending the uncontrolled use of drugs, as well as against the social evils incidental thereto, by measures generally centered and directed to possession itself of the drugs covered by the Act. The subject matter, the purpose, and the scope of the Act are such that to subject its provisions to the narrow construction suggested on behalf of appellant would defeat the very object of the Act. Such narrow construction is repugnant to the clear terms of Section 15 of the Interpretation Act. In Che Juton v. Whitehead, Chief Justice Lord Hewart, referring to the provisions of the Aliens Order, which made an offense of the possession without lawful authority of a forged passport, said, In my opinion, the order, the circumstances giving rise to which are sufficiently familiar, would be reduced almost to waste paper if the offense could not be established unless the prosecution proved that the person having in his possession the forged passport had guilty knowledge of the fact that it had been forged. It is not easy to see how that knowledge, except in rare circumstances, could be directly proved. But not only, in my opinion, is there nothing in this part of the article to put any such burden upon the prosecution, but the words of the article negative the view that the prosecution is required to carry such a burden. In that case, the appeal committee found, as a fact, that the appellant did not know that the passport had been altered and honestly believed on reasonable grounds that it had been issued to him in the ordinary course by the proper authority. The language of the order was as follows. Any person shall be guilty of an offense if he d without lawful authority uses or has in his possession any forged, altered, or regular certificate, passport, or other document, or any passport or document on which any visa or endorsement has been altered or forged. It was nonetheless decided that it was neither necessary for the prosecution to prove guilty knowledge of the alteration nor open to the defendant to secure acquittal by proof that he did not know and had no reason to suspect that the passport was altered. This case, amongst others, such as Rex v. Wheat, Rex v. Stocks, is a clear authority supporting the proposition that the presumption that mens rea is an ingredient of an offense as well as the defense flowing from an honest belief as to the existence of a state of facts may, by reason of the subject matter of the act, or of the language of its provisions, or of both, cease to obtain. 
The Opium and Narcotic Drug Act comes, in my view, within these classes of acts referred to by Justice Wright in Shiraz v. Rudson. With these considerations related to the subject matter of the act, it is appropriate now to turn to the language of the provisions of the statute directly related to the offense of possession. The main provisions to consider are those of Section 41D, reading as follows. 41. Every person who D has in his possession any drug save and accept under the authority of a license from the minister first had and obtained or other lawful authority is guilty of an offense and is liable. On the plain, literal, and grammatical meaning of the words of this section, there is an absolute prohibition to be in possession of drugs, whatever be the various meanings of which the word possession may be susceptible. Unless the possession is under the authority of a license from the minister, first hadn't obtained, or under other lawful authority. As to the meaning of these provisions, I am in respectful agreement with and content to refer to the reasoning of Justice Laidlaw, speaking for the Court of Appeal for Ontario in Rex v. Lawrence. The language of the section and the subject matter of the Act in which it is found, both considered in the light of the provisions of Section 15 of the Interpretation Act, cannot justify the narrow meaning of the word possession, which is contended for by counsel for the appellant. I find no reason which would render inapplicable to this case what was said by Chief Justice Lord Hewart in the case of Jujutin v. Whitehead. The question is not what is the meaning ascribed to the word possession in civil or in criminal cases, at common law or under statutory laws, but what is the meaning of the word under the Act and the provisions here considered. The case of Regina v. Ashwell is, I think, of no application in the matter. The question there considered was possession in relation to the offense of larceny. Larceny is an offense involving the violation of possession. It is an offense against a possessor. This is not the type of possession with which this act is concerned. In the Attorney General v. Lockwood, Alderson said, The rule of law, I take it, upon the construction of all statutes, and therefore applicable to the construction of this, is whether they be penal or remedial. To construe them according to the plain, literal, and grammatical meaning of the words in which they are expressed, unless that construction leads to a plain and clear contradiction of the apparent purpose of the act, or to some palpable and evident absurdity. The interpretation of section 41D, as made particularly in Rex v. Lawrence, cannot, I think, be said to lead to a plain and clear contradiction of the apparent purpose of the act. On the contrary, of the construction suggested by the appellant and the one submitted by the respondent, the latter appears to be the only one really consistent with the apparent purpose of the act. Nor, in my respectful view, can this latter construction be said to lead to some palpable and evident absurdity. Was not the one reached by Chief Justice Lord Hewart in Chajutin v. Whitehead? where the provision of the law creating the offense was couched in language substantially similar to the one here examined. Indeed, and when the provisions of Section 41D are further considered in the light of those of Section 17, it would seem to me that the construction suggested on behalf of the appellant would, as it will appear, bring an astonishing result. Section 17 reads, Without limiting the generality of paragraph D of subsection 1 of section 4, any person who occupies, controls, or is in possession of any building, room, vessel, vehicle, enclosure, or place, in or upon which any drug or any article mentioned in section 11 is found, shall, if charged with having such drug or article in possession, without lawful authority, be deemed to have been so in possession unless he proved that the drug or article was there without his authority, knowledge, or consent, or that he was lawfully entitled to the possession thereof. 
The language of the section is clear. Pileman has provided, one, that either one of these three facts, i.e. occupation or control or possession of any place in or upon which a drug covered by the act is found, makes, without more, one who occupies, controls, or has in his possession such a place, a possessor of drug, without lawful authority. And two, that the occupier of such a place shall have charged the having such drug or article in possession without lawful authority be deemed to have been so in possession unless he proved that the drug or article was there without his authority, knowledge, or consent, or that he was lawfully entitled to the possession thereof. In the circumstances described in this section, Knowledge, in any sense, is not an essential ingredient of the offense, but lack of knowledge, if proved, is a defense. Yet, on the submission of appellant, if a drug is found on the very person of the accused, knowledge as to the nature of the substance would be an essential ingredient of the offense, and would, therefore, have to be proved as part of the case for the prosecution of a charge laid under Section 41 d The essential ingredients of unlawful possession under the Act are the same under Section 41 d and under Section 17. The opening words of the latter section forbid us to construe the offense in a manner varying from one section to the other. This, however, is the result flowing from the appellant's submission. Furthermore, and if it is argued that knowledge is of the essence of unlawful possession, under both Section 41D and Section 17, then one is at a loss to understand why Parliament should have, in the latter section, provided for a defense resting on the proof of lack of knowledge. A like interpretation of Section 17 strips this exculpatory provision of any meaning and effect. The language of the two sections can only be rationalized, I think, by interpreting Section 41D as meaning what it says i.e. as creating an absolute prohibition and by interpreting section 17 as extending the meaning of section 41d, i.e. this absolute prohibition to the circumstances described in section 17 with, however, and only in such circumstances a defense resting on the proof of lack of knowledge, as extending the meaning of section 41d, i.e. this absolute prohibition to the circumstances described in section 17, with, however, and only in such circumstances, a defense resting on the proof of lack of knowledge. This is the first occasion which this court has to consider the submission of appellant which, ever since the decision rendered in 1932 in Morelli v. The King, the judges of the Provincial Courts of Appeal have with a few exceptions, refused to accept. The majority judgment, rendered in 1948 in Rex v. Hess, stands as the first expression of judicial opinion contrary to these views. In the majority of judgments rendered subsequently to the Hess case, the views therein expressed were not followed. This decision has no reference to the Morelli case, and it rests principally on a concept of possession which, in my respectful view, the subject matter, purpose, and scope of the Act and the language of Section 41D and Section 17 do not warrant. The more recent reported case, where a similar question was considered by the English Court of Criminal Appeal, is that of Regina v. Hallam. The provision considered was Section 41 of the Explosive Substances Act, the relevant part of which reads, Any person who, knowingly, has in his possession or under his control any explosive substance under such circumstances as to give rise to a reasonable suspicion that he does not have it in his possession or under his control for a lawful object, shall, unless he can show that he had it in his possession or under his control for a lawful object, be guilty of felony. On this language, it was decided that knowledge that the substance was an explosive was an essential ingredient of the offense. Arguments such as the one related to the concept of possession, which feature the reasoning in the Hess case, 
are forward into this decision, which indeed was reached because the word possession was there qualified by the word knowingly. Such a word, as noted by Justice Laidlaw in the Lawrence case, is absent from Section 41 d Furthermore, while possession of explosive substances is not under the English Act of 1883 subject to a license first hadn't obtained or other lawful authority, the contrary is the case with respect to the possession of drugs under the Opium and Narcotic Drug Act. Finally, the existence of such circumstances as to give rise to a reasonable suspicion that possession is for an unlawful object is an essential ingredient of the offense under the Explosive Substances Act. This ingredient does not appear under Section 41D. Reading the reasons for judgment in the Hallam case, one reaches the view that had the provisions therein considered been worded as are those of Section 41D, and as were also those of Section considered in Tejutin v. Whitehead, a decision similar to the one rendered in the latter case would have been made. As interpreted by most members of the Canadian Courts of Appeal since 1932, the provisions of Section 41D are, like many other provisions of the Act, undoubtedly severe. The duty of the Court is to give effect to the language of Parliament, and notwithstanding that the views expressed in Morelli and Lawrence, in particular, had been prevailing since 1932 and are still prevailing, Parliament has not seen fit to intervene. For all these reasons, I find it impossible to accede to the proposition that knowledge of the nature of the substance is of the essence of the offense of unlawful possession under the Act. Even assuming the correctness of this view of the law, argues counsel for the appellant, the latter could not be found guilty of either possession under Section 41D or sale under Section 41F. As to possession, Contrary to what is admittedly the fact in the case of Max Beaver, it is said Lewis Beaver, the appellant, did not have physical possession. The application of the relevant provisions of Section 5 of the 1927 Criminal Code in like matters has never been doubted. As stated by the Court of Appeal for British Columbia in Rex v. Colvin and Gladue, there is joint possession where one has a right to exercise some measure of control over the thing, in the possession of another. On the admitted facts of this case, there is no doubt that the appellant was, to say the least, in full command and control of all the operations. As to sale, though the substance delivered to and paid for by Tassie was a drug, as admittedly it was represented and held out to be by the appellant, it is said that the latter could not be guilty of the offense of sale under Section 41F because on his story, he intended and thought the substance sold to be sugar of milk. To this submission, the provisions of Section 41F afford, I think, a complete answer. 41. Everyone who F sells any drug or any substance represented or held out by such person to be a drug to any person without first obtaining a license from the minister or without other lawful authority. In the case of any sale made without first obtaining a license from the minister or without other lawful authority, the accuracy or inaccuracy of the representation made by the seller to the purchaser as to the nature of the substance sold and the honesty or dishonesty attending the representation, if inaccurate, are quite immaterial. If a substance sold is represented or held out to be a drug by the seller to the purchaser, the relevant count of the indictment does not in terms say that appellant did sell a substance represented or held out by him to Tassie to be a drug but that he did sell a drug, to wit, diacetylmorphine. In this language, however, is necessarily implied the allegation of the fact that appellant represented or held out the substance sold, delivered and paid for to be a drug. Hence, appellant's version of the facts brings this case within the provisions of section 41F. 
and if believed, would leave no alternative to a reasonable jury acting according to law, but to return a verdict of guilty. Section 41F, as well as those previously referred to in the analysis of the Act, is indicative of the intent of Parliament to deal adequately with the methods which are used in the unlawful traffic of drugs to defeat the purpose of the Act, ingenious as they may be. That the enforcement of the provisions of the Act may, in exceptional cases, lead to some injustice is not an impossibility. But to forestall this result, as to such possible cases, there are remedies under the law, such as a stay of proceedings by the Attorney General or a free pardon under the Royal Prerogative. I would dismiss the appeal under the unanimous judgment of the Court of Appeal for Ontario, affirming the conviction on the primary charges and, in view of this result, the unanimous judgment of the Court of Appeal, affirming the decision that appellant is an habitual criminal remains undisturbed. Appeal allowed in part. Justices Fota and Abbott dissenting. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademile. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademile. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademile at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at legallistening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.